Hey physics people, today we're working out the formulas for average power for resistors, inductors, and capacitors in AC circuits. So what we're looking at here is an animation showing the voltage phasors for a resistor, inductor, and capacitor in an RLC series circuit, along with the net voltage phasor and all the voltage waveforms generated by the phasors. And I'll post a link at the top to the full derivation of the RLC series circuit if you need a refresher. So as we go through our individual circuit elements in this video and calculate power for the resistor, inductor, and capacitor individually, we're going to refer to the voltage phasor and current phasor for each of those elements because to get the instantaneous power, we need to multiply current times voltage. So let's get started with the resistor. And in our picture, we have a single resistor with a voltage V of T across it and a current of I of T through it. Now recall these are both sinusoidal functions, in other words, oscillating functions, because this resistor lives in an AC circuit. And we already discovered that the voltage for a resistor is in phase with the current function. So there's the phasor diagram for the resistor with its voltage phasor aligned perfectly with the current phasor. And there's the corresponding sinusoidal functions obtained from the phasors by taking their horizontal components. And I'll post a link real quick to the derivation of the resistor voltage phasor up there at the top of the screen. So we're going to keep the phasor diagram as our primary tool here. And again, the actual wave functions are found by taking horizontal projections of these phasors. So we take the horizontal projection of that current phasor that has a length of i, and we get big I cosine omega t. Then we take the horizontal projection of that voltage phasor for the resistor. That has a magnitude of IR, so the voltage across the resistor is IR cosine omega t. So now we want to compute the instantaneous power dissipated by this resistor, in other words, the power as a function of time. And the same old formula applies here. Power is current times voltage. So the power dissipated by this resistor as a function of time is just I of t times V of t, and now we just have to sub in our formulas for the current and voltage across this resistor. So now we've got an instantaneous power of big I cosine omega t times big I r cosine omega t. So we're just going to clean this up and we get an I squared r out in front and then cosine squared omega t. So the next thing we need to do is find an average value for this function. In other words, we're looking for the time averaged power dissipated by this resistor. And we just did a nice review of average value integrals in the previous video on RMS averaging for current and voltage. And of course, I'll throw a link to that video up there at the top. So to get the average power, we have to set up an average value integral. And what I've done here is integrate the function on the interval 0 to 2 pi over omega. And you may remember that the period of a squared cosine function is actually half as much as the period of the original cosine function. So what I've done here is actually integrate this thing over two periods of oscillation. But that's totally fine for computing an average value as long as you average the function over an integer number of periods. So we integrate the function from 0 to 2 pi over omega, and we divide by the interval width out in front, so 1 over 2 pi over omega. And the reason I prefer to do it this way is just that we're used to taking integrals over the period of these trig functions, 2 pi over omega, and I just do it for consistency. So if you prefer to integrate from 0 to pi over omega, that's totally valid. Just make sure you divide by a pi over omega out in front. Now inside this integral, we have the square of a cosine function, and that's a classic trig integral that has to be solved with an identity. So we're going to replace the square of the cosine function with one half times the quantity one plus cosine of twice the angle. So in the next step, we'll just make that substitution and we're also going to clean up all the constants out in front of the integral. So notice that I pulled the I squared R out of there, and I also dealt with this complex fraction, the two pi over omega in the denominator, that gives me an omega divided by 2 pi, but then it becomes a 4 pi in that denominator because we absorb the 1 half from the identity. All right, so now we need to integrate 1 plus cosine 2 omega t, and the antiderivative of that first term is just a t. Antiderivative of the second term is just a 1 over 2 omega sine 2 omega t, where that 1 over 2 omega part is just taking care of the chain rule there. So now we need to evaluate across the limits of integration. And this is one case where I prefer to just start by looking at the lower limit of integration. If I sub in a zero for t, then the first term t is going to be zero. 
But in my second term, I get the sine of zero, which is also zero. So both of those terms vanish and we don't have to worry about them. Now, if I look at subbing in my upper limit, I'm going to replace t with two pi over omega in that first term. But look what happens to the sine function. When I sub in t equals two pi over omega, the omegas cancel out and I end up with the sine of four pi, which is zero. So out of the four possible terms generated by this evaluation, only one of them survives, and that's the t being replaced with two pi over omega in that first term. So that gets us here, and now we can do some cancellations. We can cancel a factor of two pi, leaving us with a two in the denominator, and cancel a factor of omega. And so the average power turns out to be one half times i squared r. Now note there are some alternate forms of this formula that you should be familiar with. So we start with our result that the average power dissipated by the resistor is one half i squared r, where I remember big I is the current amplitude, and then r is the resistance of our resistor. But the voltage amplitude across the resistor, we already know that can be expressed as i times r. And that allows us to re-express this average power formula in terms of voltage amplitude. So there's one alternative form of this average power formula. Note you can verify real quick that this works because if I replace big V with big I times R and I square that, one factor of R is going to cancel and we get back to the original formula. Now another way to re-express this thing is to relate it back to the original definition of power, which is current times voltage. So if I look at this expression, I squared R, I could split that up as big I times big I R. In other words, we get a one half big I times big V where big I and big V are the current and voltage amplitudes. So now there's a really nice way to re-express all these things. So in the previous video, we just wrapped up learning how to take RMS or root mean square values of sinusoidal functions. And we found that the RMS value for the current is just equal to the current amplitude divided by square root of two. And the RMS value of the voltage is just voltage amplitude divided by square root two. So we can take our average power formulas for the resistor and then express them in terms of the RMS values. So we can replace I with square root two times I RMS, and we can replace V with square root two times V RMS. And if we do that to our first formula, one half I squared R, well, things clean up really nicely. I end up with two factors of square root of two when I square that I, that gives me a factor of two, which then cancels the one half. And the really nice thing about this is that our average power formula is totally analogous to what we got for power dissipated in a direct current circuit. Remember that was I squared R. So our average power dissipated in an AC circuit for a resistor is going to be I RMS squared times R. And we can continue this way. We can replace the V up here with a square root two times V RMS. We generate a factor of two, it cancels the one half. And again, we get an analogous formula from what we've seen before with DC circuits. And for the sake of completeness, we do the same thing for the one half I times V. We replace the I and V in terms of their RMS values and we retrieve this familiar formula. Power is current times voltage, except now it's the average power dissipated by resistor is given by the product of the RMS current and the RMS voltage. So there's the average power for a resistor in an AC circuit. And now it's time to take a look at inductors. So there's our inductor L with a voltage of V of T across it and a current of I of T flowing through it. And again, we start with the phasor diagram for the current and voltage across the inductor rotating over here on the left. And we note that the inductor phasor is leading the current phasor by pi over two there. And there's the corresponding plot of the sinusoidal functions, one for current and one for the voltage across the inductor. And I'll post a link to that whole derivation up at the top. Now again, we're going to keep the phasor diagram as our primary tool here. And once again, the horizontal projections of these phasors are giving us the formulas for the corresponding sinusoidal functions. So we take the horizontal projection of that current phasor, and that gives us the usual big I cosine omega t. Then we take the horizontal projection of the inductor voltage phasor, and we get the usual IXL cosine omega t plus pi over two. So a couple things to note there, we see that phase angle of plus pi over two. So that inductor voltage phasor is leading the current phasor by pi over two. And the second thing I wanna point out is that X sub L, remember that's called the inductive reactance. And if we get into the details, that's actually given by omega times L, but we don't actually need the details in this video. So now we get to work on calculating the instantaneous power into this inductor.
And it's the same strategy. We just take the current as a function of time and multiply it by the voltage as a function of time for the inductor. So we sub in those sinusoidal functions and we arrive at a bit of a mess here because we have two cosines multiplied together that have different phases. So what we're gonna do to keep our lives as simple as possible is re-express that cosine in terms of a sine. So what we're looking at there is a cosine that's been shifted to the left by pi over two. And if I take a cosine and shift it to the left by pi over two, it becomes the negative of a sine function. So I end up with a negative sine omega t there. So our formula cleans up to negative i squared x sub l cosine omega t sine omega t. So if you recall from the derivation of the inductor voltage function, we actually started with the negative of a sine function and then turned it into that phase shifted cosine function so we could make use of it as a phaser. So now we're just going back the other direction to save some effort on our trig identities here. So now we recognize a product of a sine and a cosine. And remember, the sine of two times x is two sine x cosine x. So what we're looking at is one half the sine of two omega t. So there's our instantaneous power into this inductor. And note that once again, the period of the instantaneous power function is half the period of the participant sinusoidal functions. So we have that factor of two in there compressing that sine function by a factor of two horizontally. Now next we wanna compute the average power of this thing. So again, we're just going to do an average power integral and I just use my traditional period of two pi over omega, which is actually two periods of the instantaneous power function, but we're allowed to do that. So we set up the integral and note that I just carried over all the constants out in front here. So negative one half i squared x sub l. And then in this fraction out in front, I have one over the interval width. The interval width was two pi over omega. Again, that's actually two periods of the function that we're integrating. And we're integrating sine two omega t on the interval zero to two pi over omega. And we don't even have to do anything to evaluate this integral. I see a sinusoidal function, sine of two omega t, integrated over two full periods. And we already know the average value of a sinusoidal function on an integer number of periods is zero. So the average power into an inductor vanishes, and that's a really interesting result. It means that energy is being stored periodically in the inductor in the form of a magnetic field, and then that energy is released again as the field drops to zero periodically. So that wraps up all the power issues for inductors, and now we move on to the capacitor. So there's our capacitor C with a voltage of V of T across it and a current of I of T through it. Remember, no current can actually physically cross the gap in that capacitor, but as we're building up charge on it, that counts as a current flowing through the capacitor. And we start with the animated phasor diagram, noting that the capacitor phasor is lagging the current phasor by pi over two. And we have the corresponding sinusoidal functions generated by taking the horizontal components of the phasors and I'll post the usual link to the derivation of all that stuff up there at the top of the screen. And again, we're keeping the phasor diagram as our primary tool here. And note that I've advanced omega t a little further along this time. And I did this just to make it easier to visualize the horizontal projections of these two vectors so they're not laying on top of each other. So the current function is the horizontal projection of that current phasor. That gives us the usual i cosine omega t. The voltage function across the capacitor is the horizontal projection of that capacitor phasor. And we get our familiar I times X sub C times the cosine of omega T minus pi over two. And again, I wanna point out two things about this voltage function. First, we have that negative pi over two phase angle indicating that the capacitor voltage lags the current function by a quarter cycle or pi over two. And second, that X sub C out in front, remember that's called the capacitive reactance, and we could calculate it as one over omega C, but we don't actually need that detail for our derivation. So we get started on our instantaneous power calculation by taking I times V again. And next we're going to sub in the details about each of those sinusoidal functions. And we're in a similar jam as to what happened with the inductor, and we're going to use a similar trick to get out of that jam the cosine of omega t minus pi over two, that's a cosine function shifted to the right by a quarter cycle. Well, that's just a sine function. So that's the sine of omega t. And again, we're really just undoing something that we did in the original derivation of the capacitor phasor. When we derived the voltage across the capacitor, we ended up with a sine of omega t and we intentionally turned that into a phase shifted cosine so we could use a horizontal projection from a phasor.
So now it's more convenient to express it this way because I have a cosine omega t sine omega t, which again gives me a one half of the sine of twice the angle. So there's a nice formula for the instantaneous power into a capacitor. I get one half I squared x sub c times the sine of two omega t. And we see the same phenomenon here where the period of the instantaneous power function is half as long as the original period of the sinusoidal functions. So next we go for the average power and you might see what's coming here. We set up our usual average value integral on the interval zero to two pi over omega. That's just the period of the original sinusoidal functions or two periods of the function that we happen to be integrating. And again, I'm just integrating a sinusoidal function over an integer number of periods and I know the average value is going to vanish. So we get an average power of zero again, but this time we can say the energy is being periodically stored in the electric field between the plates of the capacitor and then released again periodically for an average value of zero. So just a quick summary of results here for the resistor. We found an instantaneous power of I squared R cosine squared omega T and an average power of one half I squared R. So that looks like half as much as what we were used to seeing for DC circuits. And remember, there's two other ways we could express that average power in terms of the current and voltage amplitudes. But then we discovered if we use RMS quantities, we end up with all the same formulas that we were used to for DC circuits. So one of those is IRMS times VRMS but I could also write down I squared RMS times R or VRMS squared over R. Then the instantaneous power delivered to this inductor turned out to be negative one half I squared X sub L sine two omega T. Again, that has half the period of the original sinusoidal functions, but the average power turned out to be zero. And that's because the inductor is temporarily storing energy in its magnetic field, but then it gives the energy back. And finally the capacitor, that had an instantaneous power of one half I squared X sub C sine two omega T. Again, with that period of oscillation being half as long as the original sinusoidal functions and the average power into the capacitor is also zero. This time because energy is being temporarily stored in the electric field as charge builds up on those plates and then it's released again as the charge comes off the plates. In the next video, we put all our circuit elements together and compute the instantaneous and average power in an RLC series circuit. And we discover something called the power factor. And this allows us to see how power depends on the relative phase of the current and voltage functions in that RLC circuit. You can find a link to that video at the upper left, and I'll see you there.